I'm here today with Dr. Fine at the University of Washington in Seattle. Dr. Fine studies neuroplasticity and today she's going to talk to us a little bit about that. Thank you Dr. Fine for this opportunity. Go Cognitive really appreciates your support. Thanks for inviting me. This should be fun. Yeah. Um, first off, can you just give us a little bit of background information on what neuroplasticity is? Neuroplasticity is a sort of general term which refers to the ability of the brain to change. Um, it's used in a number of ways, sometimes to discuss the ability of the brain to change early in development, and sometimes the ability of the brain to change in response to things like a stroke or a disease. Um, it, it can also refer to normal learning, the process by which you know our environment changes and we learn to deal right. with those changes. Can you elaborate a little bit on the development of the brain, like from infancy to adulthood? This is a fascinating topic. Um, I think it's actually the most macho part of science because studying babies is impossible. Yeah. You know, if you imagine just getting out of the house with a baby is hard enough, trying then to get a baby to do what you want it to do, you know, show you whether it understands the difference between a vertical and a horizontal bar, yeah. it's almost impossible. And these studies are really hard to do. What we do know, um, from work with animals and from work with babies um, is that during the last, you know, during in utero development and the first year of life, there's this extraordinary process whereby there's this sort of overgrowth of neurons and then these neurons get sort of trimmed back. Mm -hmm. um, pruned during the course of development. Well, what we do know is there's just this amazing structural change in the brain that happens um, where the baby kind of learns to interact with the world. And how does that change as the baby gets older, like in childhood and adulthood? I think the general consensus on about plasticity is that these, that it's a function that declines with age. So mm -hmm. you're getting unbelievable changes in the first year of life and then they're slightly you know, slower in the second year and third year and so on, mm -hmm. until eventually when you're an adult, change is very difficult. That's why teaching my mother to use a computer is such a painful process. Yeah. She's just not as plastic. I have more <laughs> trouble learning things than you do. That's why we go to college usually when we're young. Um, that's not, that's a gross generalization mm -hmm. um, because certainly there are periods later in life where you see massive change. Yeah. But um, on the whole, that curve describes how chip change over development. Mm -hmm. I understand there are two basic mechanisms of neuroplasticity. Can you explain those a little bit? Um, one is the growth of new neurons. I'm mm -hmm. guessing what you're referring to is the fact that one is the growth of new connections between neurons. Mm -hmm. So I have a neuron here and it grows a new connection to this neuron over here and does a handshake and they start communicating with each other. And the other is changes in synaptic strength. So the connection between two neurons changes its strength. Mm -hmm. um, until recently, it was thought that in adults, all you got is these changes in synaptic strength, that you couldn't build entirely new connections yeah. to different neurons, um, and you didn't grow new neurons. In mm -hmm. fact, there's some beautiful work by Rusty Gage at the Salk showing actually you can grow new neurons as an adult. Yeah. Um, and it's in fact, in fact affected by the amount you exercise. Mm -hmm fit, healthy rats grow more neurons than lazy rats that sit in front of the television. It's good to know. There you go. <laughs> it just makes me feel guilty, but never mind. Can you talk a little bit about compensatory hypertrophy and cross-modal plasticity? Cross-modal plasticity is a very common term. It's a case where someone, for example, who is blind, they um, a thir almost a third of our brain is taken up with vision, mm -hmm. 25 to 30 percent. Um, what happens to this part of the brain in people who are blind? Well, one thing we've learned is that if you become blind early in life, this back of the head starts re responding to audition and touch. Mm -hmm. That's cross-modal plasticity. Cross-modal, because it's re responding to different mode of input. Plasticity, because it's a change in the way the brain responds. Right. So I'll tell you about my sock drawer theory, because I'm not going to leave it there. The sock drawer theory of the brain is the idea that if you get a wardrobe, Mm -hmm. And you don't happen to have any ties because you're a girl and you don't wear ties. <laughs> you don't just leave the tie drawer empty. Right. You're going to fill it with you know, underwear or socks or something. And the brain is like that. If you don't get visual information, the back third of your brain isn't going to sit there and do nothing. It's right. going to start doing something. It's mm -hmm. going to be filled up with auditory and tactile information. Yeah. The socks and underwear of the input of the world. <laughs> That's my theory. Cool. 
So compensatory hypertrophy is a actually less commonly used term, and mm -hmm. it refers to the idea that the region of brain doesn't change what it responds to, but it responds in a more sophisticated way. So th there's actually a very nice example of compensatory hypertrophy in the deaf, that's a good example. In deaf subjects, their visual cortex responds to vision like you or me, mm -hmm. but they tend to have larger responses to stimuli in the periphery. And the reason, of course, is that if you're deaf, someone can't call and attract your attention. Right. Or if a car's coming, you're not going to hear it. Yeah. So what they have to do is monitor peripheral space more carefully than you or I do to get this information about what's happening on the edges of their world. Mm -hmm. And their brains, their visual cortex has made a change in the way it processes information to do that. And that is an example of compensatory hypertrophy. Visual cortex is still responding to vision, but it's doing it in a slightly different way to compensate for the effects of deafness. Right. So do blind people then hear better? Um, in a way. So they don't have better hearing the way you think of it. So mm -hmm. it's not that they can hear a pin drop from further away than you can. Right. Their sensitivity isn't higher. What they do seem to have is a better ability to make sense of the information they're getting. So, for example, they seem to be very, a lot of blind subjects, especially people who are blind early in life, are very good at localizing where sounds are coming from. And that makes, again, sense. For us, if we hear a sound, we look to see where it's coming from. If yeah. you're blind, you don't have that option. So it seems to be less a change in sensitivity than an ability to sort of make sense of the cues. That is probably just due to them having more practice with that and it being more important to them. I understand. In the same way, deaf subjects are better at distributing attention around the whole visual world. Mm -hmm. um, they're better at doing a task in the center of their gaze and then noticing something happening in the periphery. Interestingly enough, video gamers are also really good at this. Yeah? Yeah, video gamers <laughs> are incredibly good at doing a task in the periphovia and then noticing something happening in the periphery, mm -hmm. which is obviously a result of them playing a lot of video games. Yeah. I had a mother phone me up about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and she says, my, my son is trying to get into the Marine Air Force, mm -hmm. and he you know, did really well in all the tests, except there was this task on dual attention, mm -hmm. and he wasn't any good at it, and they said it's because I never let him play video games. <laughs> and she says, it can't be true. Tell me I haven't ruined his life. <laughs> and I was sort of... Well, in <laughs> fact, and this kid now has been put on this sort of enforced regime of video games for six months and so he can reset the test because the changes as a result of playing video games are actually quite dramatic. So um, deaf people, video gamers, <laughs> blind people, <laughs> the brain is strange. Yeah. Are there any other really cool examples of neuroplasticity? In fact, we spend our whole lives with really cool examples of neuroplasticity. Um, for example, if you're a dog fanatic, mm -hmm. you'll be able to tell the difference between any kind of golden retriever. If you're not a dog fanatic, they all just look like yellow dogs. Yeah. We're all experts in the things we're interested in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what are you, do you have any kind of obsessive hobbies? I wouldn't call them obsessive. I'm like into photography and I'm interested in sleep. So, so, so if you, I'm sure if you look at a picture, you have a sense of the lighting, the way the camera was, the way the picture was framed. You see it differently from the way someone like me, who is completely non-artistic, sees those photographs. Yeah. And that's because you've become an expert in it. And mm -hmm. so one of the things we know is that if you become an expert, the way you process information about that thing changes. So a chess player can look at a board mm -hmm. for t 20 seconds and then put all the pieces back. In the same way with you, if you look at a photograph, I'm sure you could say, oh, it was taken, you know, this was in the photograph, this was the lighting, this was the shading, it was underexposed, there was a shadow in the back, right? Things that other people wouldn't notice. We, we develop huge resources in our brain to understanding the things that interest us. What are some extreme cases of neuroplasticity, like with um, hemispheric lateralization? The most extreme examples are probably cases of children who have um, damaged cortex, brain damage very early in development. Mm -hmm. um, my nephew is actually a case of that. He has um, quite severe cortical damage over almost a quarter of his cortex. Oh, wow. 
And when you look at his MR scans, mm -hmm. you would assume that he would, would certainly not be able to walk. You know, his whole right motor cortex is gone. You wouldn't be able to see at all. Most of his occipital cortex is gone. Mm -hmm. He has, you know, very severe impairments, but they're nothing like as severe as you would expect if you looked at that MR and you th you'd thought it was an adult who had had that damage. Because what has happened is his brain is reorganized and other parts of the brain have taken over those functions. The wardrobe metaphor works very well here. This idea that, you know, you have cortex and you have to find space for everything. Mm -hmm. And if, in the case of my nephew, you've lost a couple of drawers, you've lost a large amount of cortex, well, everything just gets stuffed into the remaining parts of cortex and it doesn't work perfectly and you know things are a little jumbled and there's not enough space for everything and yeah but you still do much better than if you said you know he couldn't walk or he had no vision mm -hmm. so that ability of the brain to reorganize is a fantastic quality yeah um, and it's interesting how many of us have you know small cortical lesions that we never know mm -hmm. about because the brain has just compensated for them um, there's some case of a British diplomat who um, apparently is missing like half a hemisphere and nobody had noticed. Wow. But that's Britain for you. Um, <laughs> but when it happens in adulthood, if you have a stroke in adulthood, mm -hmm. the ability of the brain to be organized is much more limited. Mm. And no one's quite sure why that is. And yeah. people are working very hard on trying to kind of, mo kind of take the brain back to a sort of state of infancy where it's prepared to learn again and reorganize, because mm -hmm. that would be you know, amazing, um, but that's the holy grail and we haven't managed it yet. Um, my feeling is a lot of resources will be put into that because um, at the moment with things like Iraq war veterans, a lot of them have very kind of generalized diffuse cortical damage and if you could kickstart the brain to be plastic again, you might really be able to help those people. Yeah. But we're still a long way from doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been a great interview. I'm glad. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Yeah.